just to give a little background on the geographic context, Mystic River watershed, we like to say is the most urbanized watershed in New England. It's 1% of the land area of Massachusetts, 7% of the people highly densely populated, 40% uh, impervious surface, um, and uh, long history of industrial use. Um, it's one of the three rivers that flows into Boston Harbor. So, um, and l like all those rivers, it has been subject to pollution, um, you know, channelization, and of course dams. This is the Amelia Earhart Dam at Assembly Square in Somerville. Separates the saltwater section now of the Mystic River from what's now a freshwater section. This used to be a tidal system. That's a dam from the 1960s. And I, I often imagine the river herring pounding their heads against the locks and waiting for them to open. This is how sort of I playfully describe that, but I think that's kind of true. We do have river herring um, on, the, on the Mystic River, as you'll see. Um, but they have to make their way past, so the, the, the locks open for boats passage and the DCR, it's managed by Division of Conservation Re Recreation. They are instructed to allow fish to pass when they become aware of it from their tower, their lookout tower. Um, but in any case, they, there's no fish ladder at Amelia Earhart. I also marked the Wynn Casino site, another landmark that's about to come up in uh, Everett uh, on the Mystic River. Um, but they, they have to make it through the locks, said Amelia Earhart, and they go up the Mystic River to the Mystic Lakes Dam, a dam between two, a, a long time earthen dam between these two water bodies. Um, uh, six years ago, seven years ago, was rebuilt with a fish ladder. Um, and we instituted a visual count at that, at that fish ladder up on Mystic Lakes Dam. And um, hugely successful outreach and education program. We turn away volunteers every year. We have, you know, 84 count periods in a week. We work, of course, with DMF on this. And um, turn away volunteers every year. Um, we've been doing this now for six years. So we started in the year that the dam was installed. And this maybe pre-visages a little bit of data later in the afternoon, but this shows the date, the, so we work with DMF to do these visual counts, estimate the fish run at that location um, over the past six years. In the first years we were, the runs were estimated around 200,000. In the fourth year, it shot doubled and um, has stayed at that level in the next three years. This sure looks to a layperson like successful habitat expansion, breeding habitat expansion leading to a larger population of river herring uh, loyal to the Mystic River. You see the signal in the fourth year when that first uh, kind of uh, group of juveniles sexually matured and are returning to the river. But um, I'll, I'll defer to the fish, uh, fisheries biologists on, on whether um, that story is defensible. It's, it certainly could be true that that's what happened here. And, um, but in any case, 600,000 fish, this is the visual count for this year, passed between those two lakes. So, you, you know, we, the, the success of the outreach effort and the enthusiasm of people to do the count shows us that um, herring is, you know, I was going to say, who, who knew that herring is a charismatic species? But we all know that. Um, uh, not many people know that, but it's, it's a hugely important tool for us as an environmental advocacy organization to cultivate stewardship um, among our members. So we said, how can we get word of this migration out to more people. And so we decided to apply for an environmental education grant through the EPA. And we had an idea that we would have videos that would be sent to the internet and people could count them online. And this could be done by school kids in classrooms and teachers could develop curricula for this. And um, we uh, successfully made this pitch. I was talking to the, the guy, uh, I'll mention, uh, Jeff Walker, the hydrologist and data scientist who worked with us, and he said when he first heard this plan, he said, it's crazy, it'll never work. 
we got it working, and it's, it's very cool, um, and I hope to show you that. Uh, this couldn't obviously have happened without partnership with, with DMF and with uh, DCR. Um, we've also gotten additional, this is eminently fundable for an organization like us. We've gotten subsequent grants uh, from family foundations and other organizations to continue and expand this work. Um, and we're working with five school districts who signed on in the beginning in our grant application um, to uh, develop curricula for classrooms. So this is Ben's design, uh, which he showed you this. I'll go quickly through this. This is the installation of the box um, at the dam, um, the fish passage box, the, camp, the box that holds the camera in the water, and the laptop box that holds the laptop on site so this is one of the advantages of doing herring monitoring in a highly urbanized setting. We have AC power at the dam, and we have in that top right corner is the Tufts University Boathouse, which has a Wi-Fi signal strong enough to get to the dam. So the laptop, even in that box, so this is how it works. Um, I'll, I'll show you the, the, a vertical view of, of where the fish pass. Um, the flow uh, is coming down the screen, the fish go in, that, in the up, up screen direction. It's narrowed so that the fish are forced through that narrower opening. You can see the lines painted on the right of that passageway to serve as kind of contrast. Um, as it, and the, the camera is looking, uh, sorry, this is advancing, and I don't want it to, um, looking this way at the fish. Um, so, that's the physical piece. The other kind of cool piece that makes this run and that was designed by Jeff Walker is this um, art software architecture that takes the laptop, so the laptop motion activated records videos locally. It then, through the Wi-Fi connection, sends through FTP protocol. Uh, it, it, the FTP program grabs, it stores them in a folder labeled Upper Mystic Lake, the FTP client every hour empties that folder and puts the videos that have been recorded. Oh, and they, we record up to one minute long, motion activated, and if motion continues past that minute, it clips it at a minute and, um, and keeps recording, but records a minute long file. So it sends the, the videos to online storage. And now everything else is happening through software automation designed by Jeff. So there's a video processing service. So I'm literally gonna wave my hands at this because I saw him, uh, he described it to me and it's beautiful and I couldn't recreate it. Um, but I know how it works. It takes the videos, it serves them up to a web page where you can go at Mystic River I'm sorry, mysticherring.org, and uh, gives you a, pay, a window in which you can play a video and record a count. So the video processing service does two things. It, it, it um, processes the video and serves it to the web browser, but then it also grabs the metadata from that video, video clip. So each video clip has a unique timestamp. So each clip is recorded in a database with a unique name. And when a person on the, in the web browser enters a count, that count is attached to that unique video ID and is um, tallied in this database. So everything here is automated. Once the, camera, once the camera records the video and it gets off the laptop to the Tufts Boathouse, this all happens automatically. So the web interface, so that's the software architecture, and I can try to describe more of what's happening. I hope that basic picture is clear, though. Um, the web interface looks like this. Uh, you uh, click Start Counting. It offers you the chance to count a video. And because I happen to have it, and I'll, make, I'll, I'll show another. Like Ben, I'm showing you one that's good and pretty clear. Um, you can s begin to see some of the problems with turbidity and, um, uh, uh, you know, bubbles floating by, 
when there are many fish, it's hard to count potentially. This is a, this is a comparatively good one. I won't ask you to count. Sometimes I do. Um, but, uh, but imagine you saw this on the web page. There would be a box below that says, how many fish did you count? You enter the number, hit send. It records it in the database with, attached to that video clip and um, asks you to count another one. Right? So, and no, no video is longer than one minute. So the kind of time investment from a user's point of view is small. So Ben's um, warnings about needing many staff hours to count videos. Now, I won't confess to how many staff hours we have spent counting videos, but um, we outsource that to the world and ask people who go to our website to count for us. Yes? Once that one minute count of that video is done, is it ever given to anybody else? Yes, yes. And so, it, and I can, I, can, I can get to that. You'll, you'll see that a little bit. So counts, the same video will be shown multiple times, and we can, get an, we can look at the distribution of counts from that one video, look at the variation, the variability of counts. Um, but uh, we can now, so now you have this database, right, that's recording numbers, counts, numbers of times a video has been counted, and you can do this kind of data analysis and collection. So this is number of fish counted, fish um, counted on these days, where the videos are from these days. Um, and you can see this, um, this kind of peak of the apparent peak of the migration in late May. This is exactly, as you'll see, coincides with our visual count. You can also see numbers of videos counted. So the real number of total videos counted is more like 10,000. Um, this, this particular view underestimates that because it doesn't count repeat counts, for instance. Um, but you can see in the course of this summer, we recorded 43,000 minute or less long videos. That's a lot of videos to count. You can see the orange are the counted ones from any given day. The blue are the uncounted. Some of that is nighttime constant triggering, so it was giving us, um, and we didn't bother this year, frankly, to try to deal with nighttime videos. Um, so a lot of that is uh, no fish, nighttime videos that were getting false triggers. Um, but we have a big population of videos, and now we're kind of sampling those videos. And the algorithm that, um, that serves up the videos to the website is customizable. So he can say, focus on this time period, uh, focus on a particular day. So you can also do other kinds of data aggregation from this database now. So you can see, for instance, um, in the top left, how many fish are counted per video. So you can see, imagine how this works. Most videos have very few fish. This is probably excluding zeros. Yeah, probably excluding zeros. Um, uh, most videos that have fish have very few, but some have very many, right? So there's kind of this long tail. Um, that is also, and you could, uh, the one just below it is video duration, and you see this kind of bimodal distribution. A lot of pretty short ones when just a few fish pass in a few seconds, and then there's a gap and the motion detection stops and cuts a 20 second video. But when fish are really going by constantly, you get many, many one minute videos. So that's why there's that peak of at 60 seconds. Um, so that's how the system works. We have three kind of goals for this. Science is the third and um, uh, only equally important to the other two uh, purposes of this. But we're continuing our visual count and are very proud of it, and we're going to continue as, as uh, Ben suggested. But one um, goal of this is outreach. So th this, is, this is data off Google Analytics I just got yesterday, and I don't quite know how to interpret every detail here, but it, it records that we, when um, people logged on to interact with that website, there were 5,900 um, interactions. So instead of 100 volunteer counters, we're now having people come to their computers 6,000 times to count videos. 
3,000 unique users, 20,000 page views. Um, the average time people spent on the web page was three minutes, which is great. That sounds like three videos. 96% um, of users were from the US, though we got hits from 17 countries. I can't tell you they weren't Russian bots. I can't, I don't know what they were, but, there, but scattered across 17 countries, there were a few. And when you, t when you tally up the minutes spent counting, it's 326 hours of viewing. When you tally up the time spent by visual counters at the dam, it's 150 hours. So there's a big, we got a lot of volunteer crowdsourced labor to help us with this count. And we're, again, from an outreach point of view, this is great straight ahead on our mission. And um, we're excited to expand this. Um, uh, in the future. The second uh, goal, explicit goal of this environmental education funded grant is, um, is education, of course, and we're work we worked with, we hired an intern to work with teachers. Um, many, many staff hours went into this, but um, an intern visited schools and made presentations. We had 30 teachers engaged from six school districts and 400 students involved in 2017. Um, our promised metrics were higher than that, so we're, we have a goal to expand this educational aspect. We also brought, brought people to the dam, and I, we have a picture of, of Ben opening up a fish and kids loving that. And that was, so Ben was, was great and visited some of these events. So that um, is also very successful and we're excited to continue it. We, started this sort of um, uh, on the web curriculum uh, development and have a kind of uh, data story here about looking for patterns in previous fish runs and previous years visual data and seeing the correlation between temperature, for instance, in the beginning of the run. Um, again, for students. Now finally, this, this question of whether we can use this as an alternative way to estimate the actual run. I think we're many steps away from that, but as Ben said, you learn a lot in the first year and maybe you learn a lot more in the second year. We're, good, we're, we're very excited about continuing this. This is a very rough um, observation, but this is reassuring to us that we're doing something right. The, the top count is the daily mean count from our uh, visual count for this season. And roughly aligned under it, I tried to um, line up the dates, is the number of fish counted per day from the video count. And you can see the video count caught an early pulse in April that's visible on the, on the visual count. It, the peaks relatively line up with the, with the visual count. This looks like Pretty good, like I look at that, I'm a, a relative lay person, I say this is pretty good. If you start poking at this, um, so, the, but, so the, the pattern you'd see from the video count um, very much mat matches the pattern you see in the, in the visual count. Um, when you start poking at this video data, um, it gets interesting and messy. So this is um, a graph showing um, uh, paired counts. So notice because each uh, video is time stamped and each visual count has a 10 minute time segment attached to it, right, that's recorded by the person at the dam on their piece of paper. We can go, we can have our spreadsheet of 10 minute counts and then say pull all the videos from that 10 minutes and count, let's count those. So, and the out, it, the Jeff can say, I'm going to serve up videos selectively from the 10 minute periods where we had visual counts. So he did that and we threw some intern hours at it and we crowdsourced this. We said we wanted to do a data sprint and we said we want a thousand more counts to help us with this comparison project, right? So we're going to look at that same 10 minutes and say, what do video counters see in that 10 minutes versus what did that person at the dam see in, ten, in that 10 minutes? And this is the messy data that comes off of that first, the, at least this is not the most recent data, but that off that first look at that. So 
So every 10 minute period depicted here by a dot has two numbers associated with it. The video counts that we crowdsourced for that 10 minutes and the human count. And the human count is along the bottom and the video count is, is the Y axis. And if they matched up perfectly, they would all fall on that black line, that one to one line, the 45 degree angle line. If, they, if, if the count was 200 from the video uh, survey and the 200 from the human, it would fall on that line. You notice they don't fall on that line and the video counts are systematically lower, interestingly. So this is, they're not automated, they're people looking at the videos from that same 10 minutes, systematically lower and the kind of line of best fit there is way lower than that 45 degree line. So there are multiple possible explanations for this. We're quite sure, and we're looking for relationships between turbidity, um, uh, you know, time of day, the, oh, the four conditions especially, the cleanliness of the camera, the cleanliness of the, and I have to say that Ben spent countless hours cleaning the camera, um, but, um, and his staff, uh, the, the, uh, as the summer went on, the water became more turbid, the camera lens would get occluded with biofilm and the, the, the plexiglass screen between the camera and the back wall and the fish also became dirty, so that needs to be cleaned. So there are multiple factors here, but we're still exploring this. Um, and that's uh, to be reported later, what, what the best explanation for why the video count is lower than the human count. Um, and we have all sorts of ideas floating around about how to possibly address some of those things. This is just a final slide about um, a data, so we're again con taking that problem of why are the video counts lower and crowdsourcing it and working with a professor at uh, Brandeis who's teaching a course on citizen science to uh, do a data sprint next week <laughs> with her class where we hope to watch a bunch of uh, videos creating more data for these comparisons so that we get more information there. So again, that kind of, what do you want to call it, a technical or a scientific question turns into this engagement process and this sort of public advocacy for citizen science.